my pleasure. Um, real quick, I was just talking to Mark Tillman about you. And, Beautiful. Uh, he wanted me to tell you hello, and he might just pop in just to push up on you. I would love that to happen, man. It'd be great to have another Hoya on the line with us. He told me to say hello to your brother for you. For My him. man. No Absolutely. Problem. For sure. For sure. <laughs> My man. That's great. Yeah. So Coach, um, I just want to go ahead. I was just seeing if we had everybody on, Coach Jake, for today. Uh, yep. We're, we're the last of them are coming in. But That's a coach right there? I That's am, it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Coach Jay, we, we got we got we got uh, Tyler Thornton from Gonzaga, DC, who's uh, 28. Coach Jake is is 25. He's from Pennsylvania, and Coach uh -huh. Atkins is 28. I uh, love it. Knows in Baltimore. Yeah, you need, you need the young assistants, man. I love it. I love it. No doubt. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you can tell the Hoyas they got the old dudes over there. It's gonna be tough. You'll be tough. Keep it. He don't want to play you next year. <laughs> he don't hey, play you. We already made the call to ask. They put us on hold. Thank you. Thank you. Ask every year. As a matter of fact, go public with it. Go public with that. Yes, ask. sir. Please. Please. Absolutely. Um, but, um, man, I was just checking out uh, on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is probably the least used platform that I go on. And for, for, for a host of reasons. Uh, um, but when I saw you doing this series, I'm like, I have to reach out. Um, first and foremost, I'm glad you're back in the area. It means My a man. lot. Um, because a lot of times we leave, we don't bring that back. I mean, you went out and really did the right way. You got tons of experience. Um, you dipped into the corporate for a minute. And now you're back home. And I, I just think how was going to be a better place because of that. Well, we appreciate that. Thank so you so much, and we, we, and, and Gene, we, we thank you for this opportunity to, to, to chat with our team today. We have, uh, we have the right guys on our team, um, and, and we're ready to move the needle for us. And having these kind of uh, chats with guys like yourself and others that we've had really feel like it's, uh, it's making us a better team, even though we're not able to kind of get in the gym right now together to do that. Yes. Um, I think these lessons that we're learning right now are invaluable to. Um, not only the game, but to life in the future. So thank Without you for joining us. Without doubt. For me, it was, okay, I'm, I'm not real fond of the, the public speaking. Um, I, I just think back when I was, when I was their age and the uh, coach would bring in uh, people to talk to us. And, you know, I was front and center because unlike your coach, I only had one other scholarship offer, and that was at Morgan State. So I was, I was that, I was front and center um, listening to any and everything. Um, and, and I just remember a lot of the guys um, were kind of like, man, I ain't listening to that shit. Like, I, that, that old dude don't know what he's talking about. And for me, it was just invaluable experience because it was someone that came before me. And even if I just took one nugget, um, that just made, it, just made it an invaluable experience. And throughout my career, I just, I just got better and better. Um, wound up being a you know, valuable part of the team, got drafted. Even though coming into school, the NBA was the last thing I was thinking about. So for me, it's like, how can I reach out? Because what I have to say may not connect with the best cat on the team. It may be the guy who's number 10 on the crew, and, but he's busting his ass in practice. He's putting in that work, making everybody better. Next thing you know, he's contributing enough that he may be part of the, part of the, you know, part of the mix. Um, but one of the things, people. Gene, one of the things, sorry to cut you off, Gene, and, right, and our, our guys know this, our older guys know this, our younger guys will know this, is exactly what you said is what we play as a staff. We play guys that do it the right way, bust their ass. There's nothing given to anybody. You have to earn it, but you have to do it in the right way. So you're I think this. As, you're only as good as the, 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 the weakest link on your team. So whoever's the weakest guy on your team, if you're not steadily trying to build him up, you never know when you might need them. No doubt. Yeah. So, no doubt. So for, so for me, and then the other side of the equation is the professional tip. Um, graduated in 84, uh, you know, tried the NBA thing for a couple of years. Started with Nike in 1986. I worked at Nike from 1986 to 2008. And the experience, obviously being in Georgetown, being a Nike school, I had some inroads, but the, the opportunity to see the world, the opportunity to be a professional, to work in, work in you know, the business of sports. 
and just also to see how we're not represented. Like we're, we're the talent, but how they execute the campaign or how they execute the idea or the branding opportunities or the marketing opportunities, those are being generated by people that never see the day of light. So that there's no type of farm system within these corporations to, 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 to build people up. So if I don't speak on that, I looked at all the cats you had. Those cats, those are corporate dudes. I was a corporate dude, but I still had that DC walk in. So I just wanted to impress upon your crew, like the NBA is obviously not for everybody, but the opportunity to work in the industry, I'm sorry, you're on mute, coach. You're on mute, I can't. I'm sorry, I'm not good at technology. Gene, can Neither you please, am I. <laughs> we're at that age. Gene, can you please just give everybody your background story a little bit? Okay, okay, so my, uh, you know, sorry, Georgetown, and, well, DC born and raised. Uh, went to McKinley Tech, not to Matha. Um, we were, you know, in the inner high, and that was the public school system, um, but extremely competitive. Um, you know, we had Dunbar, you had Springarn, H.D. Woodson. Um, so I say all that to say, I was playing against all Mets all the time. And then in the summertime, we had the Jello Summer League. So I came up through the D.C. system, um, and it was just hard knocks, uh, single parent, um, everything that probably everybody on this call can relate to. Um, but was, what was important to me once I got the shot at Georgetown was, okay, how do I turn this into something that is bigger than basketball? And because I'm, I'm six feet, 180, 190, I might as well be playing football versus basketball. So my deal was to just reap the benefits. I'm going to Georgetown. I'm going I'm to parlay with the alumni. And I'll just sidestep for a second. You guys are at one of the, the most prestigious universities in the world. Um, the opportunity to parlay anywhere in the world is right there in front of you. Um, but as a ball player, sometimes we get locked into doing our shit. So we're not, we're not letting people in. I mean, we got our own little team uh, setting. And I say that in 2020 is different. Um, the opportunities are different. But my background was just making it work at Georgetown, getting me some minutes, went to two national championships, was invited to two Olympic trials, uh, 84 when I graduated, and then four years later in 88. Um, so uh, had a trial with the Oakland Raiders. Um, but again, the, the business of sport was always something I wanted, I wanted to be involved in. And as a student athlete, that's just a, that's, like, that's a, that's a no-brainer. You're already on that road. And it's something you can be in development, you can be in design, um, production. Um, I mentioned branding, marketing. These are all avenues that are, these are great jobs that I don't think, it wasn't impressed upon me as a student athlete. I fell into it just because my coach was like, yo, you need to go check out Nike. And this was in 86. So in 86, Nike was just starting with the whole brand Jordan deal. So for me, I was there in the beginning, so I saw, I saw how it grew, but also saw that there weren't a lot of people like me with my background that were getting these great jobs. So like right around my 10th year uh, with Nike, I flew myself out to Oregon. And I'm just saying this to, to kind of light a fire on the, maybe the older guys. Um, I flew myself out to Oregon basically to say, listen, I'm knocking on the door. I want, I want to be in the C-suites. I want to be on the executive level. Um, what do I have to do? I, I spent three years working in Portland. I worked in Memphis at the distribution center. Um, so I paid my dues. I'm here 10 years. I worked in sales. Um, I'm ready. And they had no answer for me. And again, that would, that would have been 96. I had to take it back to the streets. So I took my ball. I went back to the tri-state area. I worked in Jersey. Um, Philly, New York, and Connecticut, and I made it happen. I mean, I, I just embarked on a, a, an incredible sales career. Um, wound up selling over a billion dollars worth of goods, footwear and apparel and accessories throughout my career. Um, the glass ceiling was in full effect, but I never uh, approached it as a victim. I approached it as how can I get the most out of it and make sure I leave the door open for the, for, for the next generation. And Based on what's going on right now, the climate that we're in, the world that we're in now, you see all these brands basically, you know, throwing out donations, basically putting a bad band-aid on the situation. 
it's an internal scenario. Um, externally, all the brands are cool because for the most part, they have their athletes to do the heavy lifting. Um, but on the inside, the things that, it's like when you, when you buy a car and you don't lift up the hood. If you go under the hood, you don't see the, the very people that are, uh, you know, rep, repping in basketball, repping in football, uh, the athletes. And all of the, cam all of the campaigns are generated usually by a person of color on a, very, on a very low end of the totem pole. Case in point, the whole Black Lives Matters uh, campaign for Nike. Obviously, Colin Kaepernick is, is their guy. The, the, they, they took the black employees that they had in somewhat of a senior level, or junior level, I should say, because there are very few on the senior level at Nike, and they crafted a campaign. But it wasn't a campaign. It was, it was hardcore. It was basically, you need to take a stance on this. You need to come out with a position, but it shouldn't be about selling anything. Well, I think everybody on the phone will remember or knows how it came to market. It came to market with the Air Force One. It came to market with product. It came to market with something that they sold out. I'm a sales guy. I'm not saying that shouldn't be part of the equation, but that's not how it started. It started out heartfelt. It's a social issue. Let's do it from the heart. So um, that's my career in a nutshell. I currently have my own consulting firm. I work with smaller brands. I just finished up consulting for Adidas. Um, and that's what I really want to impart on, on, on the team. Um, talk to each other. Build with each other. Um, whatever your likes or dislikes are, whether it's fashion, whether it's food, um, whether it's travel, all of those things make you that much more marketable. So as you're doing your whole social media um, component of your life, you want to share that. Because if I'm a brand, and it doesn't have to be an athletic brand, if I'm a brand and you're bringing good looks, you're in shape, positivity, you're something I want to align, you're somebody that I want to align myself to. So those opportunities are way more present now than they were 10 years ago. Um, so that's the whole being a part of what's digital right now. And, and you youngies know that better than me. I mean, I, I'm probably going to lose the call pretty soon. So I, that's why I'm talking real fast. I want to make sure I get everything out. Um, but coach, my career at Georgetown set me up for my professional career. Did I, did I kind of give a good uh, summary there, coach? Okay, he's probably going to need to Absolutely, absolutely you did. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so, so I, I mean, I sent some things out to you, coach, that I kind of wanted to go over. Um, but what I love about this day and age, um, you can, you start with one thought and because things move so quickly, you wound up thinking about something else. So I, I guess what I really wanted to share is, um, you know, the, the history of Howard that I know and the responsibility on the crew to, to take that to the next level. Um, when I came out, um, of, of McKinley Tech, uh, it was 1980. And if I'm not mistaken, Howard was running the MEAC back then. It was Rodney Wright, James Ratliff, um, James Ratliff, and Larry Spriggs. And I, I guess I impressed upon the crew to do your homework on the history because you're a part of that now. Um, and you, you want to leave that legacy behind. Um, so, and with Coach being back there, I just think you have all the elements. Um, and I might be hard pressed um, who to root for if Howard was playing Georgetown. My mom's worked at Georgetown for, uh, I'm sorry, my mom's worked at Howard for over 30 years. So Howard is close to my heart. So that's one of the reasons, one of the other reasons why I reached out to you, coach. Um, because again, I, I really have a, a special place in my heart, heart for the Bisons. Um, so that's kind of the track I got on today. Um, so those questions that I send out to you, Coach, or those points that I send out to you, I'd like to, at some point in time, bring in some younger cats to really um, chop it up with your team about it, because these opportunities in this industry um, are, are tailor-made for us. And it's just one of those deals where I don't think we know. Um, and a lot of the people that you have come on talking, like, you know, they're, they're coming in with that corporate position. I'm coming in straight gangster. 
Like we need to kick in the door with these jobs. I mean, because they're great. They, they, they're, they're everything you embody. Um, you know, branding, marketing, athletics, uh, positivity, community. Um, everything starts at the grassroots level. And I think all of the brands do a pretty poor job on the grassroots level because if anything, that's where the culture is. And they're able to benefit from the culture with, with the celebrities. And coach, I, I'm sure you can, uh, you can add to this because of your Under Armour stint and also you had your own brand for a while. So we lead the culture. So why should we not be leading the culture within the brand? Um, so, yeah, th th that's kind of what I really wanted to, to share with the crew. If anybody has any questions or, Coach, if I, like, I just really wanted to get in front and just let them know there's some real cats out there that walk your walk and not going to come in talking to King's English, but we keep it professional and we know our business. Um, because for me, it, it starts with the culture. It starts with the culture. And that's everything. I, I think you can have all the strategy in the world, but if you have no culture, if you have no bison culture, coach, you can draft up all the places in the world, but it's not in here. You don't believe what you're doing. You, I think you don't come up short. No, no doubt. No doubt. Gene, what, what was, um, when you got to Georgetown, what was, what was the culture around Georgetown? Um, just within the locker room, how was, uh, what was the, where were you guys at when you got there versus when you graduated? So Big John got there. And if, anything, if you guys don't know who Big John is, John Thompson was the premier uh, black coach probably for, for two, a couple of decades. Uh, just recently stepped down from the Nike board. Um, so he parlayed it many times over. Um, he got to Georgetown in 72. And in that 73 season, um, there was a banner hanging at Georgetown that said, nigger flop must go. Now, I'm sure Coach knows Big John is pretty cerebral cat. So word on the street, he might have put that banner in there himself, which again, that's marketing. That's branding. That's putting the university on notice. Like, you're going to have to run me out of here, but I'm going to win games. So... 72, 73, by the time they got to 78, they started to get good. And that manifested into 1980, they went to the Elite Eight. And they also beat Maryland twice in that year. And there was always a big local, there's always a big local rivalry. And I miss those local games, playing against AU. Playing, we never played Howard, um, but GW. I, I, I hope, I hope. Um, DC gets back to that. I hope DC basketball gets back to that because I think that that's that's deep. That's 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 again that's culture. That's DC basketball culture. But in 1980 they went to the Elite Eight. Uh, Bebe John Bebe Jordan Craig B Scott Shelton. So they were on the cusp in 1980. So 80 81 was a bust. We finished 21 and 10, lost in the first round of the tournament. But Big John had a locker room that was big on um, us against the world. Um, was big on, because the press was very unfavorable back then, uh, particularly because Big John walked the walk and talked the talk. Um, so the locker room was, we were very close, but doesn't mean that we, once we, once we left the locker room, doesn't mean we all hung out together. That's, that's a, you know, that's a, that's not necessarily what makes a good team. It's when we in that locker room and we between those lines, it's, it's cool if we kick it outside, but we're on the road so much together. Um, I, I encourage, particularly when you're at universities like Howard or Georgetown, I encourage you to, to parlay with the student body as much as possible because that's part of the experience. And sometimes as, as a student athlete, we forget. Once your four years is up, they on to the next. And if you didn't take advantage while you were there of those relationships, you lose. Don't get me wrong. That ball is why you're there, but there's just so much more. And I always say, if it's on the table, don't leave it on the table. Get the bag. Get the whole bag. So um, the Georgetown climate was very, very strong, very, um, very D.C.-like because we had a lot of cats from D.C. Um, but it was like um, – we're going to do whatever we have to do to have a great program. 
Then the Jamaican arrives the next year, and the Jamaican is Patrick Ewing, the, the current coach. When the Jamaican came, everything changed. So we went from uh, just arriving to have arrived. But still, from a national standpoint, didn't a lot of people know about Georgetown. And actually, most people thought, because of the makeup of our, of our team, black coach, all black players, they thought we were HBCU. They thought we were, there's a Georgetown College in Kentucky. They thought we were that Georgetown College. So after 81, 82, it was on and popping. Um, the following year, uh, we lost to North Carolina in the championship, the Jordan jump shot, which um, was difficult for me um, later on in life because I wound up working for Grand Jordan. And at one sales meeting, Coach, I'm walking into the, to the sales meeting, they got the huge ass banner with MJ hitting the jump shot over, over uh, Eric Smith. And I said to myself, see, none of these cats play ball. Cause if they play ball, you wouldn't do that to a cat. Like that, that, that was disrespectful. <laughs> so, um, but uh, we were clearly on our way after Patrick got there. So long story short, three final fours, uh, three national championship games in four years. And, I don't think the program has gotten its just due uh, from a standpoint, dynasty, legacy, um, the impact we had on college basketball back then. And I say that because I didn't know myself. I didn't know the impact we had on black America. Um, but I found out much later when I moved to New York because New York cats were like, yo, we was rolling with y'all, public enemy. I, I talked to Chuck D, he was like, you were, inspiration for us back then. Um, but, you know, I, I, when you're a student athlete, you kind of get focused on your, on, your, on your deal. I just think in 2020 for the members of the team, get outside of your world because there's so much you can align yourself with. Um, whatever you're doing on social media, take it serious. Not saying that you can't have fun, but pick your platforms. And all your outreach games should always be on. If you see something you like, uh, if you see, if you hear something you like, don't be afraid to DM someone and get on there. Just build up that communication level. Um, because we live in this age now where it's real easy to, to just reach out and gather information. It's, it's case in point. Like I said, coach, when I saw you doing that series, I'm like, I got to reach out to my man. I got to let him know we out here, we rooting for you, man. We cheering for you. Um, but again, this other side of the equation, I want the youngins to know there's a lot more out there once the ball stops bouncing. And don't be afraid to ask, look who just popped in. <laughs> Mark Tillman. What's up, Gene? How you, how you doing, sir? I'm doing good, man. Another horn in the building. <laughs> <laughs> Coach B, what's happening with you? How you doing, man? How are you, Mark? I'm hanging in there, man. I'm hanging in there. Hey, he told me he was coming on, so I wanted to hear some of this knowledge he was giving to the players. <laughs> I love listening to him talk. No doubt, no doubt. He's a legend, and our guys. Uh, it, it, I, 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 I joke with friends of mine that grew up in you know the era that we grew up, and I said if you if you look up the word defense, it's a picture of Gene Smith. Um, our guys don't know, but Gene probably was one of the best defenders in college basketball history. And that's not something to uh, take lightly. It's something he's, he's, he's one of my heroes. I, and, you know, a lot of guys, you know, these guys are too young to know that. I had um, basketball cards of all the Georgetown Hoyas on my wall growing up. And uh, Gene was part of uh, a lot of good childhood memories for me. So I really appreciate him being here, Mark. Thank you for joining. Ty, we got another Gonzaga guy on here. <laughs> Gonzaga, man. I Gonzaga mean, legend. That's Gonzaga right. Legend. Eagles fly high, baby. Eagles fly high. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Eagles fly away, too. We lost one. Eagles fly away. Yeah. 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 Gene, yeah. what um, was what were practices like for you guys in terms of the competition part? And how did you guys approach practice? What was what was your daily mindset like? Okay, I'm going. I'm going to pause on that, Coach, because I, I I just want to. I got to celebrate my my man Mark Tillman. Um, Mark means a lot to me, um, uh, professionally as well as personally. Um, and I just want to share a story for for the crew. 
uh, to kind of explain what I'm talking about, um, building amongst each other. So I get this incredible opportunity with Adidas to consult. Um, they're trying to get back in the basketball business. They got James Harden, they got Dame Lillard. Um, but for me, that's all Southwest. That's all, you know, the West Coast. What y'all doing in D.C.? And I was like, okay, well, there's some opportunities in D.C. Well, who do I know in D.C. that got their ear to the street, that knows the pulse of what's going on in D.C.? And as I mentioned earlier, it's got to start with grassroots. And Mark Tillman, D.C. basketball legend, um, but a pillar in the community, uh, collegiate, high school, pro, knows everybody in the, he, the business of sport. If you look for the definition of the business of sports and you open the dictionary, it's Mark Tillman. So for me, I just reached out to Mark and literally we hit the ground running and we accomplished a lot. But we accomplished more than the brand was ready for. So I just wanted to highlight that. And if Mark would add to that scenario, I would appreciate it uh, because it was really, imp it, was, it was impactful for me. And I, I'm just sitting up here telling my wife, I, I, if I need a PR guy, man, I guess, <laughs> I, I guess you're the guy for sure. But nah, I, 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 first of all, you know, Gene, I, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to, to come with you when you were consulting with Adidas to, to bring the grassroots level here um, to this area at the time uh, when we were doing some things. Yes, Adidas wasn't ready at the time. And um, I got on the call late. Coach B must didn't see I was on there. I was sitting on here waiting for about 30 minutes. And I'm just joking. But I don't know where you left off. I mean, where you started at. But I don't really want to talk too much about myself and what I did. I just want to talk about, you know, some of the things that I heard you talk about culture with some of these these young gentlemen that you have on uh, on the Zoom call. And I think, Gene, that you should explain to them, and if you haven't done already, I apologize, because yeah. I know we used to have these in-depth conversations about the culture about Georgetown basketball, you know, what that meant not only to us, but to the world and the, and, and the inner cities of, um, around the United States and what it, how it impacted these young I guess I'll say black young men around the world. And yeah. when you start talking about culture, you should probably give them more information of what that is and what that means, because we are the culture. If you look at the landscape of college basketball, um, professional basketball, who do you see? You see people that look like us, but when you have people in certain positions um, at brands that doesn't understand our culture, um, maybe that's some of the reason why some things fell within the brand as opposed to other brands. But if you can elaborate on that some so these kids can understand, because as you educated me, there's a tremendous, I mean, tremendous opportunity. And, and Coach B would know this too, because he was at Under Armour when um, a couple of few years back before he came back into coaching. But there's a tremendous opportunities that I think these kids don't understand where they can take their talents to because they are part of the culture. So um, probably uh, I like how you represent Under Armour too. See, th 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 this is this is marketing branding at his. He's not going to get on a call with Howard, who reps Under Armour with a Nike T-shirt on. <laughs> and that's something that again, it's small, it's subtle, but it, it's it, it's it's that's what it, it, it's it's impactful. It's impactful. So um, to kind of touch on what Till is talking about. Um, when I started with Nike in 86, I had the, 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 the opportunity to start from the bottom and work my way through. So I worked in distribution, I worked in production, I worked in design and development. And even though I was a fish out of water, I wasn't afraid to ask questions. But what I learned was the budgets for basketball, the budgets for running, the budgets for whatever category are in the millions. Um, and that's, you know, th there's a person responsible for that. And if the person that's responsible for that is not from the community, then they have to find someone for the community. How awesome would it be if the person that was responsible for that $200 million budget actually knew people and how to, how to, how to distribute that? So uh, I guess the money that's involved on, uh, has only gotten 
bigger and better. So, and the responsibility to do the right thing um, is almost every day. And and the, obviously, the 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 more contacts you have, um, the more impactful you, you you can be. But if there aren't people from the community, if there aren't people from the hood, they're in the, in these decision making um, positions then you're always gonna get something watered down. Kind of the, 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 the Colin Kaepernick scenario I gave you. It will start the right way, but they'll leave, so, they'll leave all that passion and all that heart and all the tough stuff on the, on the cutting room floor. Um, and then what you'll get is a sales campaign. And I think particularly in 2020, you know, the young people, I mean, I'm a backseat driver now. Um, I don't know if anyone had the opportunity to listen to the Dave Chappelle, um, uh, George Floyd, um, little special he did. And it's like, I'm almost 60 years old. I'm looking to help um, the youth navigate. I have, I have my shot to create change. Not to say that I'm not ready to get busy, but it's like, I'm using my experience and my knowledge to help those who are moving faster than me. Um, so I, I, I cannot um, emphasize enough. The, the decision making needs to be made by people from the community, from the hood, the student athletes who go through it every single day, know what, knows what it takes, understands the nuances of the business, right? Because again, if not, you, you, you're just pimping the culture. And I think we all know what that looks like. Uh, that, that, that's an ad campaign that, you know, may sound good and it's, it's transactional, right? So we, there's really no lead behind. Uh, the one of the reasons why I wanted to work with Mark in DC is because I knew what we were trying to establish wasn't going to be just a seasonal campaign. We were trying to lay bricks. We were trying to lay groundwork. Uh, we were trying to lay groundwork for Adidas to be successful the right way in DC forever. Like, it, it, because if you build those blocks, I mean, if the, if the street, I almost used a, a, a bad word, so sorry. I'm glad you're here because that look caught me. <laughs> but if the streets know you rocking with them, they'll rock with you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's just understanding the money, the amount of money that's involved uh, in the industry footwear, apparel, accessories, branding, marketing, development, design. If there are any designers that are on the team, you should be thinking about how can I create my own logo? Because in a couple of years, NCAA cats will be able to make money off their likeness. So you should be thinking about that already. Um, because if you're not, then you know, you're missing an opportunity. Um, so uh, did, did I elaborate enough till they at least yes, something? You did. Yes, you did. Okay, Coach. Coach, now what, what was your question, Coach? <laughs> I, 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 yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I, I was just – I wanted to know, like, and I wanted our players to hear from you, what was the environment like every day in practice, the competitiveness of, of practice? Like, how did you guys go after each other? Okay, so um, Big John was routinely criticized for having a cream puff schedule uh, – during the year, during the regular season. Um, and partly, you know, we, we playing in the Big East, so it's going to be rough and tumble once we get, once January or February kicks in. Um, but for me, being the type of player, I loved practice. I was the type of player that if you were really, I was the type of practice player that if you were really good, you ain't want no parts of me. Because I was coming like it was a game every day. Because I realized that's what gets you in the game. If you practice like you, and you're going to practice like you play anyway. I didn't have a turn off, turn on switch. I won every single sprint until my last practice senior year. I was that dude. So I was following you in practice. But the biggest, um, I guess the biggest compliment I got was uh, the summer of my, between my freshman and sophomore year, I worked at the gym. And I worked out every day. When Eric Sleepy Floyd walked in the gym, and I was going into my sophomore year, he was going into his senior year. He's all American. He walks in the gym and he just starts working out with me. And he came every day. 
And he's the dopest cat on our team. And he realized, well, this motherfucker, this dude here <laughs> is going to beat me up every day. Like, this dude here is serious about it. And, and that was practice. Our practices were wars. Like, our practices, and you did not want to be on the, on the, on the uh, blue team. The blue team was the team that Tillman was on, the, the first team. You wanted to be on the white team because you could just whack, 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 whack. I mean, you, you could break the play. <laughs> you could do all kind of stuff. But our practices were full out wars. And I'm sure that that made us obviously game ready, game tough. But we were, we were always, you know, we were always 10, 12 deep. And I would love for Till to elaborate on it because y'all had some pretty, Incredible crews as well. Yeah, we did. And, and, and to, to elaborate on, on that, you know, Gene is a, is a little bit before me. And he, obviously he played on the championship teams, the final four teams. We were close there. Um, lost to some final eights. Unfortunately, I'm still, not, I'm still not over the Xavier game, too. And, just, and, just so and, you know. Um, unfortunately, against some Dukes teams. But, you know, we're not going to talk about <laughs> that. But, um, but Kenny, uh, Coach B, as you said about – you know, what was it like in practice? You know, coach held it, held everybody accountable. And, you know, it was so physical in our practices. And, you know, I played with two Hall of Famers, Alonzo Mourning and Dikembe Mutombo. And we had some very good teams. And as Gene alluded to, practices was like war. And for most of us, we look forward to that because it was a lot of trash talking. It was a lot of scores to settle within practice. If someone got out on you, you better be ready the next day. And coach, he, he, he kind of, you know, intensified that, you know, that's kind of what he wanted. And it's been times where there's been a lot of scuffles where he had to call practice and send people home. That's how intense practice was. And he expected everybody, when you walk in that door, you better be ready to go. And if you wasn't, especially during the holiday season, like around Christmas, Thanksgiving, when kids go home for the we break. Hated the holidays. Yeah, we, everybody hated the holidays. You know, it, it, you can be in there six hours. And, you know, we were already practicing three hours. He'll let you finish out the first three hours. Then you got to start back up and start practice all over again. So you had to have the right mindset when you walk in. And if you didn't have the mindset, you was going to pay for it. So that's holding everyone accountable when you're in practice. And, you know, I, I, and to this day, I can still remember a lot of things that happened in practice. And I really enjoyed practice a lot. Even the games were... Practice was tough, but the games were easy. That's, that's how it was for us, you know, playing for a very demanding coach. Um, I don't know if Gene talked about, you know, coach used very colorful language. As you, you know, he always say, I speak three languages, profanity, slang, and English, and I speak profanity damn well. I mean, he was serious about that. And, um, and like he said, it was always us against the world when it was time for us to play. And that's the kind of mentality you got to have once your career is over. And that's why athletes tend to make uh, great working people because, because, because Fortune 500 companies want people who can, who can handle pressure. And usually athletes are the ones that can do that. And I, hopefully I, I answered your question the best that I could, Coach B. Well, what, what I want to add, because Mark's memory is incredible. And we, if you haven't figured out, Mark and I talk all the time. We haven't been talking as much because I got a newborn back here now. So. But Mark and I usually are on the phone a lot. His memory is incredible. And he always, always reminds me of the intellectual practices we used to have at Georgetown, where coach would, he would be, we'd be in a row, and he would be sitting in front of all of us, and he might pull out the newspaper and read something from the newspaper and ask each of us, or pick someone, like, ask you what you think about what's going on in the world. So he might ask, like today he might ask you, like, what you MFs think about this Black Lives Matter stuff? And don't be the dude that says, I don't know. <laughs> well, I was that dude. <laughs> that, that, that happened to me. Um, and I, I want you guys, when you get a chance, if you don't know this name, name is Jimmy the Greek. He was a, a sportscaster that talked about how black athletes were bre breeded like horses because we were so athletic, big, strong legs. So we had this mental practice. So coach sat everyone down and I'm sitting in the middle of the row 
and everybody's giving an answer. He gets to me. I basically said, man, basically I didn't care. No, I don't, I don't know. And I probably had probably the most colorful language thrown at me in four years there. I wish he could use it. <laughs> yeah. And, and but one of the things that sticks out in my mind is that, you know, he said to me, and it was a, it was a learning experience, it was a teaching moment for me, is that he was telling me that, but first, before he got to that, he was like, you know, all you kids care about is reading your own press clipping. But if they bomb in the world tomorrow, you wouldn't know it. But have an opinion about something, because it doesn't make you, it doesn't make a right or wrong, but just have an opinion, having to say about something. And that's what he was very good about in terms of, you know, teaching us and preparing us for the real world. So we always had those mental practices. And we kind of look forward to the mental practices too, because, you know, he would talk the whole three hours and we wouldn't really have practice. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Fellas, let's open up the floor a little bit. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, Gene, I, I have one question. I know with, with everything being done uh, over the last, you know, with all the social unjust in the country, um, a lot of the executives have uh, been, I'm not going to say exposed, but, you know, you look at Under Armour, there's no body of color uh, on there in their executive level. Um, Nike, I think when I saw that one ad that was going around social media, now I don't know if that's everybody, but I didn't see anybody on, uh, of color in their executive level. Um, what advice would you give our guys um, in, in terms of things that they may want to do in the future um, to not be prevented to, 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 to get to that level? And, and that's where I think, again, I, I, th I think I mentioned you know, um, follow the top executives at Nike. Follow the, the global VP of apparel at Under Armour and, and reach out. Um, if Under Armour is sponsoring your school or if Nike is sponsoring your school, they send someone in to, to talk to you guys. They send an exec or a marketing person. Pepper them with questions. Seek out internships. I mean, New Balance did a deal with, uh, and I forget the guy's name. He, he opted not to go into the pros, and New Balance paid him a million dollars a year. He learned what it was like to be at the sneaker brand. And that's great for them because once he starts to play, that's a perfect segue. I just think the opportunity to challenge the brands now, like rip the Band-Aid off because it will only continue. I shared my story with you. I flew myself out on my own dime to knock on the door. So, so we're here in 2020 and pretty much the same, the numbers are the same. It's like when we talk about the NBA. There were 14 black coaches in the NBA a few years ago. Now there are only seven. Why are we just talking about that again now? So I would say to all the young cats, find a brand that you're interested in and reach out. Let them know where you're at. Let them know what you're doing. Let them know what your interests are and ask if there's any opportunities to work there. In the summer, I'm graduating with this. Um, I'm interested in this. Like, and, 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 and let no be inspirational because you know, it doesn't really start. The transaction doesn't really start until someone says no. Um, but it's just one of those things you have to reach out. You can't, you know, again, as, as, as a student athlete, that's all I knew. All I knew was 94 feet. I'm picking you up. I'm kicking in the door. Um, that was my MO. Um, but I mean, I mean, if you're being given a lot, if you're maybe the top cat on the team, you might not think that way. You should think that way even more so. If I'm, if I'm Zion's people, I'm telling Zion, start your own brand. Create your own logo. Now, if I want to go talk to Nike, I'm coming with that in hand. So we can be partners, but there's no ownership here. We have to start thinking like we have to own our own content. We have to own our own logo, own our own business. Because what can Brand Jordan do for Zion that Zion couldn't do for himself? It may be more difficult. It may be a longer haul. But at the end of the day, you're still Zion. You just have to, as long as you're surrounding yourself with the right people. And for me, that was part of my impetus for wanting to come on. I, want, I, wanted, to, I wanted the youngest to know that they're, they're cats like me who got busy in the industry. 
and the industry wasn't kind. But that doesn't matter. You know, the, the door is slightly ajar, right? And you just got to kick it open and use whatever connect or con. Use coach. I, I'd be knocking on Under Armour. If I, coach worked at Under Armour, use coach. I mean, use whatever resources you have. And, you know, I want to digress for a second because there's a young man I, I wanted to bring on. He's a, he will be graduating from Howard in 2021. He has his own apparel brand called The Shop. LHP, and you can look it up on Instagram. And we all know him. We all know to hear. Yeah, yeah, we all know. If you're thinking about how can I market myself, how can I brand myself, conversate with him. I worked with his dad and his grandfather. They were my account in New York back in the '90s, so I pretty much birthed him. But again, this is us helping each other, and. It's just, I think it's, it's, it's a fallacy that we're not in the game. It's just that we're not at the, we can't direct. We, we, we can't, I can't just call up and say, yo, KB, that young cat you got that's graduating as a senior, I need him as an intern. And, and, and we need to get to those positions. And I just think now it needs to just, the bar has to be raised. And it can't just be about I'm hooping to play in the NBA, or I'm hooping to play overseas, or I'm going to the G League. Man, go get some of these corporate jobs. They pay better, it's less on your body, and you can see the world. And you can, part, you can always parlay it into something else, whether it be your scouting service or your own brand, or I just think the opportunities are in abundance now. And it's, it's again, I mean, I encourage, I encourage youngins to almost document everything that you're doing in a way that, you can speak to it at a later date and share it with somebody at a later date because this is who I am. Because profiles and resumes and all the CVs and all that stuff is going to be outdated pretty soon. I mean, it's going to be like, yo, let me, let me see this link and tell you everything about me. And we're probably already there. Um, but, yeah, I just think it's, it's, it's there. The bar is there to be raised. And I think the more uh, – if you get another corporate cat on, ask him how many brothers there – that are, are a little bit more aggressive and you've seen them not move through the, through the company well. How do we deal with that? Um, because again, we can, if all of the Nike, if all of Nike diversity is in retail, then they're not doing a good job. So yeah, I just think it's, the opportunities are there. We just have to go get them. We just have to be more mindful um, of leaving that door open and more mindful of asking the, the, the question. You gotta ask, you gotta ask for it. In my last question, then I, I want to turn it over to our crew. Okay. Um, both of you guys, Mark and Gene, please, with, with your marketing and branding ex expertise and backgrounds, what would it look like and what would it mean if Howard was really, really successful in basketball? <laughs> Ooh, I'm going to tell Solid that. Man, if, I, if, I mean, DC would be jumping for sure. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if Howard, which I believe that you can do Coach B, you know, again, I'm not just saying that. We've known each other for a long time. I'm, I'm glad they got somebody in there like you, such as yourself. But if, if, if Howard basketball is really successful, obviously what's happening with, um, you know, Georgetown and Merlin, it's a possibility. I mean, if you look at, and I hate to bring up the other uh, HBCU school that is supposed to be the other H, they're not, they're not HBCU school no more. And those kind of things can happen that you can move up into a, another class of a, in the basketball level. So um, if, if that happens, I mean, the skies are the limit for recruiting in this area. Um, so many positive things can happen, you know, for the school in just this area alone, my opinion. And, and I'll, I'll piggyback on that by saying, um, just because you are Howard and you have that history, which is rich, it's just a rich cultural, uh, the things that Howard has uh, contributed to the world. It's just one of those things, if I was playing at Howard, I would probably be um, showcasing all of that um, from 
events that are going on on campus, um, some of the, the probably classes that are happening that aren't happening other places, whatever is unique to that Howard experience, I would be showcasing that. Because it's only a matter of time be, before that five star, one and done, whatever that is, makes that move. Um, but I would be, I, I guess the brand is strong enough. Um, but if you were winning, it would just put it over the top, obviously. And again, I'm challenging, um, I guess, the, the crew you have to highlight your successes throughout the year as they're happening. Um, don't wait for the season in review. Uh, you know, I did a little homework and went through some of the, the YouTube, uh, the YouTube channel and, and the camaraderie's there, the energy's there. Coach B's in the building. Um, it's just one of those things where, okay, the last time you won the MEAC was 82, 83, 84. Win the MEAC. Start with winning the MEAC. Start by making some, some statements, like putting people on notice. Um, because, again, the tradition is rich. Um, and the basketball tradition is there, but it's, it's something to be built upon. But if Howard was successful in basketball, to Tillman's point, it's a wrap. I mean, it's – Again, Coach B, I, I think you need to publicly challenge Georgetown every year to play. <laughs> and Duke. And Duke. <laughs> I, I've already thrown that challenge out to Duke. Hey, keep throwing that gauntlet out there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, fellas, let's open it up. Any of you guys have any questions? When it comes – when it came to you guys, like um... – doing your who, time who, who, who talking to Isaac. Hi, hi Isaac how you doing man how you doing Mr. Jane good um but during your time at Georgetown when you had a uh institution like that you know especially uh back in the day I, I forgot what year you said you played you said 84 I graduated 84 Tillman graduated 88 90. 90 90 90 okay so how was it how did you navigate through I think during that time, especially when I think you guys were only valued or in the history of, you know, America, you guys were probably more valued because you were on the basketball team. Um, you know, then if you weren't on the basketball team, you just would have been a black dude. Right? right. So how did you guys have to carry yourselves or how important was, how important was your off the court um, uh, life, you know, just the things you did, the things you expressed interest in, um, so you could hold up, you know, that image of, okay, um, I, I play at Georgetown, you know, I'm a basketball player, so I'm going to be good, but I got to keep up this, you know, this, this space. So I'm not looked down upon like, you know, everybody else would have been back in that, you know, that time, time frame. So, so for me, Isaac, um, it started with, um, you know, how I was raised. Right. So, um, I'm bringing that to the equation, and so I'm I'm, I'm going to represent, you know, my, me and my family accordingly. Um, the Georgetown situation was was eye opening for me. It was the first time that I actually, you know, was in the same room with white people mm -hmm. uh, on a, a on a personal level, then on a scholastic level. That was all new, um, and you know, basketball, the the the, the hoop situation was a safe haven. Uh, my freshman year was my well, was my most difficult year. Um, McKinley Tech, where I went to high school, we were solid in academics, and I was a solid B student. But once I got to college, I didn't really know how to study. Um, so I had to figure out how to study. Um, but just in terms of how I carried myself, I mean, I'm always carrying myself with pride. I'm always carrying myself forthright. Um, and if there were any altercations or anything out of the norm, you know, I dealt with them front and center. It was, uh, it was fortunate that we had someone like a Coach Thompson's stature, right? So if you had an issue, you had someone that you could talk to. You had someone of a, you had an older father figure, you know, older cat that was wise enough and wasn't just going to give you, well, you have to be perfect, right? It's just one of those deals where, I just learned as I went along and I developed people skills. 
like I developed a way to, to navigate. Um, but it, 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 it didn't just happen. It was trial and error. Um, and it's just one of those things where, because again, this is it's still DC. So it's still, it was still Chocolate City. It's not Chocolate City now. Um, but it was still Chocolate City back then. So I always had that to kind of fall back on. Um, but yeah, I, f- I found that my freshman year was my toughest year, just figuring out how to, how to, how to move and groove. It's kind of like w- once you go from junior high school to high school, like you, you, you figure it out. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I, I, I made sure I was, maybe I wasn't the most well-read, but I, I tried to read and, and stay abreast of the, the social climate because that's always helpful. Um, and I made sure my conversations with people were, were of things other than just basketball. So if you're just trying to have a basketball conversation, I probably was like, all right, cool, I'm out. Um, yeah. Till, you want to piggyback on that? Yeah, I, I, I would say for me, um, my, my, my story is, is almost similar to Gene, a little different. Um, I was a little bit blessed. My, in terms of, like he said, it comes from your parents. You know, I was fortunate that my dad played professional football, played with the Jets and the Saints. So I kind of understood that how you had to carry yourself. And, but for me, I grew up in a community, as Coach B knows, we kind of grew up in the same neighborhood. And I went to school here, as you probably, y'all probably heard of Don Zag High School, never been around white folks all my life. So that's kind of where I, I got my introduction to in terms of, you know, being introduced and being around white people. And it was a culture shock for me. I mean, I, I, I take it. I'm walking around with my fist balled up, waiting to hear that word. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was, and it was really, I was intimidated. And 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 then from an academic standpoint, coming from a public school and going to a very um, high educational high school, um, I struggled. It was it was a struggle. And I got I'm, I got great grades when I was when it's coming up, but it was it was a culture shock for me, and I struggled academically. But you know, I had to bear down and get myself together. And I, I figured it out going into my senior year. I really figured out how to study. And and once I got to Georgetown, it was it was a cakewalk for me. I mean, I graduated with honors. And, but thanks to my upbringing, but you know, there were incidents at Georgetown freshman year. Um, I remember a young white woman, we was in, in the cafeteria. And I can't exactly remember what actually, the kind of conversation went but I know it ended up with her saying, the only reason you're here is because you can play basketball. So I proceeded to tell her before I threw water in her face, was that you don't know my academic background, you don't know where I'm from, you don't know nothing about me, but you automatically assume. And he did throw water in her face. He's not making that up, he did. And, and you know, and that, that was a big mistake on my part. Yeah. And obviously I got in trouble for that. I almost got kicked out of school for that. But that also taught me a valuable lesson that you're going to have people say things to you because you you on a certain plateau, especially at that level, that you that at times it can be difficult to stay even killed, but you you have to because you not only represent your parents, you represent the school and you represent yourself. So that was a big, big change for me at that point. But I kind of understood, you know, you know, what life was going to be like being around, you know, a lot of white people. And, I, and Isaac, I, I'll, I'll take that a step further um, because I mentioned uh, uh, when I was talking about the Nike scenario, after 10 years, I flew myself out to Portland to knock on that door because I wanted, I wanted more. Um, and I won't say my Georgetown experience directly helped me deal with that, but it certainly gave me the wherewithal and the courage to ask for more. Um, it certainly, and you know, at that time, there were very few brothers at Nike. And the brothers that they had at Nike, they were all either in marketing or, you know, they were in sports management positions. They're, you know, they, they, they weren't any execution people. They, they weren't any day-to-day people at the corporate office. And, you know, for me, it's just like, okay, well, I, I had a similar situation. And, and again, if you don't ask, you'll never know. And the fact that the answer was no, Gene, we don't have anything for you, it, it didn't stop there for me. I took that no and turned it into a yes someplace else. So I, got, I, I went from being in development to going into sales. And sales was a much more uh, welcoming um, uh, business unit for me. So it's just, it's just one of those things where 
you know, if, if you're in a situation that's, you know, you're, it's unfamiliar, um, you know, you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta learn by, learn by trying. Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly don't, um, don't be afraid of the challenge. I know one thing you said earlier that, um, that actually triggered some thoughts that I had earlier um, in the past week or so was how you mentioned uh, Zion. Like Zion doesn't need Nike, doesn't need Jordan Adidas, but he doesn't need any of it really because Zion is Zion, right? Number one pick, he has all the marketability, the celebrity status, whatever you want to call it. And especially in today's climate um, when, you know, I think a lot of people are learning or not, a lot of people are learning, a lot of people are, already familiar with, you know, how just the horrors that black people have went through in the past. Like you got Tulsa, Oklahoma and the Black Wall Street. I think the black dollar circulated like 80, 81 times before it actually left the city. And, you know, that was, you know, set on fire and, you know, and stuff like that. So I think, and people are starting to promote black owned businesses a lot more. I haven't seen, there's a lot of solidarity going on in the black community and hopefully it continues. Um, for the long haul, like where, you know, a lot of people are canceling out a lot of, you know, white owned companies who may support something that, you know, hinders the progress of black people. And we understand that the racial gap, um, the, the generational wealth gap right now is really, uh, it's actually getting wider and wider. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people are recognizing that and trying to fix it. So I definitely, I just want to, not a question, but I just wanted to, you know, definitely agree with that, that um, if there's any time to actually start something, especially being, you know, a black person, and today's climate is definitely a, it's a golden opportunity because you already have the, your, the community support. I mean, as a crew, and I'll just, I'll just definitely piggyback on what you're saying, but just, it's just as a crew, like, um, as players, like, you know, you, what are you using your platform for? What are you speaking of? Obviously it's something that you wanna converse with Coach B about, but like, how are you using your voice? Like, um, where are you showing up at? Um, and because if not now, when, right? So it's, it's just not about hooping now. And not, you know, the, the, the landscape for the black student athlete is changing. And press, press forward, press forward. I mean, if, again, it's something as simple as that, if you like to design, like you can start dropping stuff on your on, on your sock on your wristband and then something you can parlay later right you can start to tell a story or messaging through what you wear um but it's just using that positively you can reach out to young people in the summertime doing community work and if i'm a brand ambassador or if i work for one of these brands and if i'm linked in i'm going whoa he's already rocking under I'm, let me let me see if i can't tap into that because you know if you and I go into the hood, you got more shot of reaching the kids than I do. And I'm aware of that. So I got I to gotta utilize that in, in, in the right way. So the, the value of a, of a student athlete has only risen over the years. That's why the NCAA is constantly being challenged now. That's why the rule changes are in effect. So yeah, great, great question, though. And, and let me that. say this one thing before you go to just elaborate on that a little bit, that we don't want to miss... Uh, misunderstand when we talk about Zion doesn't need Nike or Adidas or whatever brand it may be, you still have to understand the business. That means you have to study, you have to research, you have to have people around you that have like-minded, um, like, like such as yourself. Um, because if you can walk in the door with, you can have 10,000 people following you, but do you know how to monetize it? So we, you need to understand the business part of it, get people around you to understand that. And I think that's very important. And, and, and the last thing in, in relation to that is that when you're going to meet somebody to talk to somebody for the first time or Coach B introduces you to somebody, make sure you know everything you possibly can about that person. Because a lot of people like to hear about themselves. But, but, but more importantly is that you don't want to go to a picnic. I'm going to give you this example. You don't want to go to a picnic with just your plate and fork. You want to bring the food. That's the value. What value can you bring? Can you offer them that they don't have? That's what you need to find out. That's all of you. Whatever industry, whatever profession you, profession you, go, into, you go into, you need to find out what's your value, what's your worth. 
because that's how you make the money. Not coming in there with a fork and trying to get fat and a plate. Yeah, I feel you on that. That's why I thought um, a couple years ago when LeVar Ball came up with his own uh, BBB brand and he actually made the whole, uh, I guess, I don't know, the BBB league or he made his own league and stuff like that. People mm -hmm. thought he was crazy, but I, I thought he was a genius. And I think that actually took a step. It may, you know, put pressure on the NCAA because then you had the G League stepping in, uh, making it accessible for high school kids to go um, go straight to their uh, to the G League, to their little, uh, whatever they call it. So, yeah, I definitely understand. Like, somebody like that definitely knew the business. But, Ozzy, do you think he monetized it, though? Um, I don't know because it kind of fell off. But I think he it's gone. it's gone. It didn't fall off. It's gone. Yeah, so all, I, but I think he got what he wanted time. out of it. Well, again, remember I told you if that bag on the table, you're trying to get the whole bag. Yeah, yeah. So, so my point is, from a, the the idea, what he was trying to do was brilliant. Base the more the most basic shit is the shit that's brilliant. What he was trying to do was basically, uh, I got a family of motherfuckers that I'm gonna bring to the table. Uh, we're going to do business. We understand what allocation, we understand limited is more. I mean, he had, he had celebrities buying the product, but yeah. in terms of how to execute it, which factories are you going to deal with? Where are you going to make the product at? Is the product good? Because again, you can have my mind space, but if my feet hurt, I, 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 can't, I can't even, I can't relate. So I don't know if he, to Till's point, I don't know if he knew how to monetize, and I also don't think he had the, because at the end of the day, it comes down to the people you have on your team. So I don't think he had the people on his team that understood the business part of it. And he, was just, he just became a loudmouth. He just became braggadocious. Um, but I, I, I love the idea. I love the idea. Like, I think the industry is, is ripe right now for another footwear brand uh, to make a move. I don't know if it's going to be Anta. I don't know if it's going to be Ling Ning, um, but it's going to be someone that's going to take a real aggressive approach with diversity, a real aggressive approach with inclusion. And I, I, that's why if I'm, on, if, I'm, if I'm a student athlete now, I'm challenging those brands. I'm, and, and I'm forthright. I'm, I'm, I'm being forthright. I'm being professional, but I'm also being direct. So to Till's point, I'm going to know maybe how many black employees they have in the particular department. I'm gonna do my homework. So yeah, I, I just think you're 100% right. The opportunity is now, not tomorrow, uh, not you know a year from, not when I graduate. Like you start yeah. now. Yeah, definitely. I sometimes think that um, as athletes, you know, at least some of my friends that, you know, also play college ball, they think that, uh, you know, that's their only identity. You know, I, I think you're limiting yourself or everybody is if you're just trying to be a ball player. Like, that's what some people ask me, you know, because I have these other ventures that I'm interested in uh, right now. I'm, You know, I have goals and other things outside of basketball that I'm trying to accomplish. And I think some people or athletes who are serious about the game, because I'm very serious about basketball, you know, you know how I, you know, play on the court and stuff like that. But, you know, I can give my 100% into basketball and do other things. You know, you look at Kobe, you look at LeBron. Though, you know, Kobe was an entrepreneur, businessman, investor, but Kobe was the hardest worker as well. You know, on the court, LeBron, he has his own school. You know, he's an investor, like, you know, and yeah, you, you know, a number of other examples. So I definitely think that uh, can't limit yourself. You just reminded me of something. I'm going, I'm going to send Coach um, 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 an Instagram uh, handle for you guys to follow. And it's a, it's a good friend of mine. He's a professor, but he does 20, 30 minutes a um, couple times a week, and he's just talking about the stock market, how to invest for beginning investors. And this is just things, again, if you're not, if you're not checking it out, like, what, what are you looking at? I mean, I know Pornhub is free now, but, you know, it's just, <laughs> some, it's just some other things out there that you got to – you got to grasp because for me in 84, man, we had none of this. I mean, you know, it was, it was like, yo, you finish hooping. Uh, we had a couple cats on the team that might have been business majors or whatever, but for a lot of us, it was like, okay, what am I going to do? And if you don't 
maximize that alumni experience and you go to Howard, so you should be maximizing that. Again, when, when that four years is up, they on to the next. And you want to make sure you get everything you can while you're there. Definitely. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Hey, Till, have you scrolled to the right? There's a lot of cats on here, Till. Yeah, I see. Yeah, man. I appreciate y'all, man. I appreciate y'all checking in. Even the blank screens, I appreciate. I have a, a quick, um, going back to what you're saying, it's the, the right time for a shoe brand to make a move. Uh, do you think Puma's kind of trying to do that? I know Meek Mill just sponsored Hillcrest Prep, one of the, uh, the premier high school teams in the country. So it seems like they're trying to make that move. Well, it's, you know, you, you real serendipitous right now. I had a uh, call with Emory Jones. Um, you know who Emory Jones is? Does anyone on the joint know who Emory Jones is? I do not know. Wow. Okay. So Emory Jones, who said that? Coach Thornton, the Jay-Z right-hand man. Okay. So what's up, Coach? What up with you? Not much, not much. So I had a conversation with Emory um, regarding Puma basketball. And um, it was like talking to – Till, it was like talking to you. Um, and this is a cat who, as he put it, I was on vacation for a minute. Um, he's been working for – we've been working with Puma for 10 years. Um, he took that hit for Jay. Obviously, Jay looked out when he, when he got out. But he was just t talking to me about his trials and tribulations dealing with corporate America. And here I am uh, in some annals. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a triple OG. I've been in the industry for so long. And here's a cat with a Baltimore dude with experience that's rooted in culture, that's rooted in fashion. And he up in there talking with the CEOs of a German company and pushing their wig all the way back. Like just talking about what's right, what's wrong. The whole, the Solange deal, the Rihanna deal, the Big Sean deal, that all came from him. And it was, it was, I told him, man, this is like, and I don't get excited talking to that many, you know, I'm not, I'm not a stargazer, but talking to this dude, what he been through, and to see him flourish in this corporate setting is insane to me. So it, it Again, that, but that, he knows his value. His value is storytelling. His value is community. His value is connecting the dots. And at the end of the day, just knowing what's fly. And, um, but what he broke down to me was the game has changed in terms of, of, of making money as a basketball brand. Um, right now, you got Jordan making money as a basketball brand. You got Nike men making money as a basketball brand. Everybody else is pretty much a placeholder. Um, he shared with me, because I said to him, you signed all these guys in your first year. Why did you sign all these guys? Like, they're just, they, nobody is over the top. Like, I think DeAndre Anton or, um, yeah. I, I, pardon me? I said DeAndre Ayton, uh, there's a few, DeMarcus Cousins. DeMarcus Cousins, who's kind of on the back end. But they signed a bunch of guys, and he shared with me at that first basketball meeting, they told him, we don't need basketball players to restart Puma basketball. We have, Puma has a legacy. They have an archive. And, and the game has shifted because now you got people waiting to wear Yeezy basketball. I mean, if Hove came out with a basketball collection, you'd have some players wear that shit. So the paradigm has shifted from just the athlete selling product. So Puma has a shot because you got cats like M over there that understand the culture and they'll make the right moves. The biggest challenge, and this gets a little bit further into the, the whole business thing, the biggest challenge for them is how are they going to distribute the product. Brick and mortar really doesn't exist anymore. Everything's online. But the only brick and mortar that is relevant is Foot Locker. And Foot Locker, as much as they try to be a cultural haven, they're really not. Because at the end of the day, they're a bean counter. If you're being traded on Wall Street, you're a bean counter. You're looking at your, your bottom line. So at some point in time, that bottom line is going to coincide with what's the right thing to do for the culture. 
So Puma has a shot. Um, but if they try to act like a basketball brand and going out just to sign in the next best hooper, um, they'll, they'll just be wasting dollars. So I don't know if I answered the question, but they got a shot with M over there and J over there. Thank you. You're welcome. Coach B. Nate Garvey. <laughs> Where's my man Nate Garvey? I'm trying to see what Nate looks like. Is Nate still on? No, Nate bounced. He, no, his phone, he's having trouble with his laptop and his phone, so he's been coming in and out on his phone and his. Okay. Yeah, okay. I fly, hey, Coach B, that wouldn't fly with Big John. <laughs> <laughs> I already know. But Nate, already Nate, know. Yeah, I already know. <laughs> That's why I didn't go to Georgetown. You went to Duke. I wanted to bring Nate on because Nate has done a, a couple years of internships at Under Armour and oh, uh, has been offered a job after he's done uh, at at Howard. I don't know if he's going to stay um, in that um, in that industry or take a look at something else. But I wanted to get Nate on to uh, to get some some other uh, feedback and, and, and thoughts on this, on the game a little bit. Yeah, feel free to give him my direct if he wants to link up on that. Um, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Fellas, any other questions, other thoughts? Okay, uh, and Mr. Gene, can we get that Instagram uh, that oh, you were yeah. talking about? Um, for which one, for the stock or for, yeah. the, for the stock? Y'all already know that's my that's my little thing. Yeah, Isaac's out here. He has his own course, so he's. <laughs> Checking for Isaac. Uh, it's Professor Milligan. So Professor uh -huh. and then Milligan, M I L L I G A N. You know he old. He only got two hundred sixty five followers. So. But I tell cats, cats all the time if if it, if it, if, it, if, it, if it's le less is more. So. Usually, if, if somebody don't have a lot of followers, that might be somebody you really want to check for. Because it, the, the culture sometimes gets into a sheep mentality, right? Everybody's going the same. You know, my, I, I work for Brand Jordan. I'm still blown away that that brand is still as powerful as it is. I have a, a, my, my great nephew, who Till knows, Jeremiah, is 10 years old. I tried to buy him some Kyrie, some Hardens, anything. This dude don't even know who Michael Jordan is, but he's so, and he's from the DMV, but he's so conditioned, all he wanted was Jordan's. So yeah, that, that Professor Milligan is a good look. Um, uh, yeah, like it, it, it definitely gives you uh, something that you're not getting every day. Hold on, one. Nate's, Nate's back on, but he had a question for you. Um. Hello? Nate. Yeah, what's going on? My bad. My phone died, and it's taking a minute to recharge. It's all good, bro. Oh, Nate, Nate was sitting like this the whole time. What's up, Nate? <laughs> what's going on? What's going on? Uh, I don't know if uh, you were asked this already, but I had a question in regards to, like, grass. And like, I just, from what I know, I mean, I've worked, I interned at Under Armour and, like, talked to the basketball department a lot. And just talking about, like, how AAU is such a big thing now and, like, even just sponsored tournaments. Like, I grew up in New York, so I played in, like, Dykeman, Rucker, Hoops in the Sun, all that. So where do you see, like, the grassroots involvement, like, changing, like, new, I guess, ideas coming forward, like, in the future? Is Till still on? I'm going to let my grassroots expert take that, and then I'll piggyback. I'm not the grassroots expert. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't even hear the question. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, just, like, how do you see, like, the grassroots uh, connection in the community besides, like, AAU and, like, sponsored tour basketball tournaments, like, evolving in the future? How do I see it doing what? It's like, evolving. changing in the future. How do I see it evolving? Wow. I mean, you, you, you really can't do anything without grassroots. I mean, that's where it starts. I mean, you know, as I learned from, from Gene that, you know, you, you want to be able to create mind space. So, you know, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, in my opinion. I don't know what's going to happen on the AAU side. Um, you know, whether USA Basketball is going to take that over or not, I have no idea. But everything is still going to start at grassroots level from day one. Mm -hmm. I don't see it going anywhere. Um, okay. 
because I'll they're your future customers. Yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll piggyback with Till. I think all the brands do a pretty poor job and on the grassroots level, which is why, the, why, why I align with Till to begin with, because, you know, it, it's, it's, initially it's not a money-making proposition. Um, it's just one of those deals where you got to plant seeds that will grow. And, you know, it can't be transactional. You can't just drop off a bag and then bounce. Or, you know, you got your eye on the next number one pick from high school. It's got to be a deal where you invest. Um, you know, you're building better facilities. You're building better gyms. And also you're empowering the people that do it every day, right? Um, uh, the DMV is, to me, right for a brand to come in and, and show up the right way. When I say the right way, you know, it, it starts, it's, it's, it's only starting younger. And if they're, if, if they're only invested in AAU, then they're just pimping. Like, it, it's, it's like you got to go all the way down to middle school now. And, you know, it's got to be about more than just basketball. Are, are, we teaching, uh, are we teaching social skills? Are we teaching uh, finance? Are, are, you know, are we teaching, um, you know, a more elaborate curriculum? Um, because, I mean, if kids are, if kids are jumping uh, from high school to the pros, are we setting them up with the foundation that, you know, maybe that those years of education, um, they can come back, but we're giving them something in the interim. So we're teaching people how to live, um, mm -hmm. how, to, how to handle their money better. And brands fundamentally don't get that because, again, the people making the decisions haven't gone through it. Like, if you ain't never been broke, you don't really know how to have that conversation. If you've never really been without a meal, I mean, you know, empathy is a, is a tough word for a lot of people. So, I mean, I just think one of those things, if, if you're, in, you're in some of those meetings, and I'm sure you've been in those meetings and you heard some things going, you're like, that's just really not that important in the hood. So yep. why are we even having that conversation? We don't need uh, expansive campaigns anymore on, you know, what to buy and how to shop. And, you know, and we certain, certainly aren't test pilots anymore. And, we're, and again, I talked about what retail has come to, now, to me, it's, it's got to be more about events. Um, it's got to be more about, you know, putting a, a stake in the neighborhood, putting a stake in the community. And you, you need Mark Tillman's to do that. But, and, but, but, let, me, let me expand on that, Gene, because you, you bring up a good point about the, the, um, the retail. So one of the things that when me and Gene was working together with Adidas, when he came to me a couple of years back, um, I had to end with, Downtown locker room. I had it set up not only with downtown locker room for Adidas to come in and they were going to buy product. But the biggest thing I had was I was ready to have DCPS schools in this area to sign a deal to buy all their product from Adidas. For whatever happened, and we're talking about from elementary school up to high school, and for whatever reason, you have decision makers who don't have the vision. And to this day, this, I still don't know why they didn't take advantage of that. And you're gonna come across those kind of hurdles. And I'm sure Coach, Coach B can tell you that from being inside the brand himself and me and being a consultant on the outside, but bringing, you know, bringing value to the table. And we were talking about them spending money, not giving away, spending money. And I just, for the sake of me, I still don't understand why a lot of these, these brands don't get it. Mm -hmm. they don't get it. Sure, I, I appreciate it. a perfect time, though. I mean, I, I do believe in what's going on right now. I mean, you look at the Uncle Ben's of the world, and your mamas. I mean, you look at all that stuff that's taking place now. You know, you're starting to have a lot of these athletes starting to speak out. You know, I, I don't know if you read about what... Um, with the guard from the Lakers and Kyrie Irving is doing. They're trying to get these owners on board. You know, they're kind of forcing their hand. You know, what are you going to do for commu the community? You need to spend some money if you want us to come back and play. You know, they're starting to take over. They know who has the power. Uh -huh. 
Hey, Nate, stay in touch with me. It's, it's, it's hard over there on the um, Stay in touch. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you gonna need the OG to talk to. Stay in touch. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I encourage anybody on the phone, uh, anybody on the Pretty call. Sure, yeah. Yeah, anybody on the call, feel free to to, to reach out. Uh, any industry stuff, um, I, I'd be more than willing to share. Um, because again, you're gonna get some answers sometimes that you're gonna scratch your head, and it may it may come from a person that looks like you. I don't know if anyone's on the phone has uh, on the call has ever read the Spook Who Stepped by the Door, and if you haven't. It's old as old as can be, but you might want to pick it up. Um, and it's just one of those deals, and it's still in effect to this day. So I'll bring in um, a brother, and the brother espouses all of the corporate values. So that becomes your report to it. Your, and you're thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm in, until you run into something that doesn't set right with you. And again, this is nothing other than being prepared. This is not saying it's good or bad. We got to get out of thinking what's good or bad. Sometimes that's just the way, that's just the way it is. And how you react is the most important thing. That's when it starts. So, you know, it, there'll be people there that you, you think you're getting the right advice from and it's not the right, it's not the right play. It's not the right play for you personally. But in order for you to coexist, you might make that move. And then you find yourself stagnant and you don't know why. So it, it's just one of those things, how it prepares you for this. Coach B is preparing you for this, right? When the, when the challenge comes, how to respond. And, you know, it's like Emory Jones says, bet on yourself. Bet on yourself. Hey, hey, Gene, just the last thing uh, before we run, and thank you yeah, guys so much. The last thing, we'll talk all night. <laughs> I No doubt. If, 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 if we can grab a glass of wine after that and let the kids go and continue this conversation. <laughs> I, I would love to get um, your thoughts on what's going on right now. We are, um, you know, being at an HBCU, um, I love that our players have taken an active role in – uh, this social issue through, um, you know, their Instagram stuff, their social media. Some of the guys have been out and protested. Um, we've, we've had different conversations about social activism. Um, if you wouldn't mind just talking about your thoughts about where things are right now, that'd be great. Yeah. I, I think uh, it's, it's, it's interesting. I've, I've gotten a couple of calls from old Nike um, bosses. And it's funny because my, my wife will be listening in the background and I'll get off the call and she go, she'll ask me, who was the boss? You sure you weren't the boss? Um, but it's one of those things where um, this, this is not the time to be, to be protective over image or, or uh, it's just about, we're at this point in time where you have to, take the baton. I know that's an old adage, um, but this is really a youth movement. And whatever you're doing, uh, thank you, but do more. Um, um, the messaging uh, has to be clear. It has to be direct. It has to be, we've been here before. Where are we going from here? And it's a constant. It's not because it's the, it's the, you know, it's the talk of the town right now. Everybody's fixated on it. Well, we have to bring it to a manageable, we have to keep the conversation manageable and we have to understand that um, it's, 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 a, it's a incumbent upon me to deliver that message. So when the, when the, when the gentleman called me, um, I was, the first thing I said was, how did you not know? Like, you know, systemic racism is, you know, systemic, like, it, that means it didn't just start with uh, the knee on the neck. Um, the knee has been on the neck for a minute, right? And so it's one of those things where you want to educate, um, but you also, you want to be vested in, in, in the struggle. And whether that's protesting, or oh, you went with the glasses, good look. Whether that's protesting, you know, I can't help myself. 
um, whether that's protesting, whether that's you know being on your your your, your platforms and, and educating. But I just want to say, make it consistent. Establish a cadence um, that people can um, can uh, relate to, right? And 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 I'm sure the youngins are better at that from a social media standpoint than someone like myself is. But it's just one. Of, I don't care if it's a TikTok, but it has to be a way that you're being relatable, but you're also passing this thing through because it's 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 heavy. Um, but th there sh really should be no going back to status quo. So th I hope that uh, that resonates because it, it re again, me getting on this call, even though Till might disagree, I, I struggle with talking to young people um, because I, I feel like you know you're 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 at that point in time where you're you're figuring it out for yourself and you're making making moves and the last thing you want to hear from is a old dude. Um, but it's one of those things, the more you do now, the better. Be educated, listen, poke people that if you're unsure about something, get some James Ball within your life. You know, um, yeah, just uh, cause it's, it's so much information out here uh, that you can make yourself knowledgeable or aware and you know, I, I mean, get you a Jewish friend, uh, you know, like uh, get outside your comfort zone, but continue to share and be on the front lines. Be on the front lines. Mark, can you, uh, can you add anything to that for us, please? Yeah, yeah I could definitely add. Um, I, I can say this, that as a team or a group, you guys are one voice and you definitely can make a change. And, you know, I've been sitting here thinking what Gene's speaking about, you know, I'm sure you guys have TikTok and Instagram. When you look at all the followers you have, you know, all you all can be can become one voice, and one voice can change a room. And if one voice can change a room, then it can change a city, it can change a state, and it can change a nation, and then it eventually can change the world. So this is how you guys have to think right now because the world is in you all's hands. I'm on the back half. I'm a golf player now. I'm on the back nine of my life now. But now it's the beginning for you all. And you all can make the change. Get out and vote. Do what you need to do to make a change in this world. And I think this world will become a better place. Well, look, fellas, I, I swear, man. Yes, sir. Take that and send that to me. I mean, I, I wish I was recording this thing. Man. We got we to gotta record it for you. Oh, <laughs> hell, hell. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, until if I was 18, man, I'd run outside right now butt naked. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Look, guys, we want to thank you guys so much for taking time out to hang with us today and uh, really appreciate all the wisdom and gems that you guys gave us. And uh, we're certainly going to build on this. You know, some of the things that we've done as a program is, uh, you know, we're, we're working with a, uh, our fellas don't know this, but we're working with a, a when we all vote, which is Michelle Obama's organization. And we're going to be the first uh, sports organization to work with that organization to help um, people register to vote. And in particular, our, our agenda and our goal and initiative is going to be to help young black men register to vote. Um, we are the biggest uh, population of non-voters um, in that demographic. So, um, you know, we, we're going to be doing that starting in July and uh, some other things that we're working on behind the scenes to, uh, you know, uh, projects that we're going to be starting to build on. Um, one thing in particular is, you know, the injustice of, of, of uh, you know, policing. And that's something that's going to be really important for, I, I think, our crew also. And, I, you know, so those are a couple of things that we're going to start to work on uh, starting in July. Um, that we'll be doing as a team to be front and center in this movement that's going on right now. So, any kudos to you and your team, man. I appreciate you letting me crash the call today and just give some a little bit of wisdom on whatever I had today. But, you know, I'm proud of you, my brother. You know, we go way back. You know, I'm definitely going to support you, whatever you need done. And if I can help you in any kind of way, you got my number. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it. Gene, thank you guys so much. I just want to say, hopefully it illustrates to the team, uh, what we think of Coach B. Um, I mean, we two Georgetown dudes, and how it's special to us. Coach B special to us. This is this is bigger 
than any one person. Um, and I mean, I echo what, what Mark said, Coach B. Anything you need, man. I'm on the West Coast now, like I said, and we'll we'll stay in touch. Um, but yeah, man, thank you to the to the youngins for letting us bend your ear, um, because it it mean it means as much to me or to us as it does to you. And if it doesn't mean anything to you, I can understand that because you're young. It might creep up on you later, but it means a world um, to me to be able to talk to, to, to youngins that were going through something different in 2020 than I did in the 80s. And uh, any anytime we can be a resource, don't, don't hesitate to get at us. Like I said, it's easy, but Coach B is, uh, man, we're rooting for you, man. We're cheering for you. Thank you. And, and Jane, I hope you don't mind. I'd love to I have your email. And Mark, I got your email. I'd love to share uh, you guys' email addresses with our guys no um, so they can stay in touch. If any, any questions or anything that they uh, have, uh, you know, looking for information, they can reach out to you guys. No, no, no doubt. Hey, hey, B, Coach B, can I leave one parable before we leave? Yes, sir. Man, that's my man. There was a man who got up at 6 o'clock in the morning and started walking. There was another man who got up at 12 noon and started running like hell, but could never catch that man that got up and started walking at six. Which one are you? I'll leave you with that. Thank you guys. Much appreciated. Fellas, appreciate you guys, man. All right. And we'll see you tomorrow. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate it. Thank you.